the international trade in mercury. Most recently, in 2021, UNEP finished a two-decade-long campaign to rid the world of highly toxic leaded petrol, saving an estimated million lives each year. As the world grappled with pollution and waste, another crisis was brewing. I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies. But now I wonder if they will even exist for my children to see. Poaching and habitat loss were pushing some of the world's most iconic animals to the brink of extinction. Driven by science, UNEP supported a series of international treaties, limiting and in some cases banning the trade of endangered species, safeguarding migratory animals, expanding protected areas and increasing financing for biodiversity protection. The seminal Earth Summit in Brazil introduced the idea of sustainable development. This is an historical moment for the mobilization of all peoples of the world. Over the last five decades, UNEP has helped more than 100 countries enshrine the right to a healthy environment in their constitutions and produced scientific studies to guide member states in their decision making. In 2012, a new international body was established to provide scientific data on biodiversity in a joint effort from UNEP and other UN organizations. In 2019, it found that one million species face the threat of extinction, underscoring the urgency to act. Every action we take alters the Earth that future generations will inherit. The world is starting to recognize the effects of planetary warming, but UNEP began sounding the alarm three decades ago. As early as 1988, UNEP and the World Meteorological Organization launched the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. For over 30 years, IPCC science has helped member states counter climate change, earning the body a Nobel Prize for its work. UNEP-backed studies have informed some of the planet's most crucial climate accords. These include a 1992 agreement that set a template for curbing greenhouse gas emissions, followed by the Kyoto Protocol and the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement. I'm proud to announce that 175 parties have signed the Paris Agreement. UNEP has also mobilized 450 banks, insurers and investors to help create a more sustainable world. We don't want fossil fuels anymore. A lot has happened in the last 50 years, but it's the next 10 that will be pivotal for life on this planet. But in fact, what you and I and other ordinary people around the world can do will not by itself save the natural world. The great decisions, the great disasters that face us can only be dealt with by governments. And that's why this organization is so important. Over the past 50 years, we've seen when the world decides to act, the world comes together to act. Together with member states and partners, we've achieved a lot. But now is the time to truly make that lift for humanity and to do much more and much faster. And I have every reason to be hopeful. As an organization grounded in science, UNEP will do everything in its power to push for breakthroughs. Our planet and humanity depends on us. Together, we can build a greener and safer and fairer world for all.
Yeah, an amazing evening to you all. We believe you're doing great, and the weekend has been restful and productive indeed. It's so good to have you in a fourth series of the workshop of Teach for SDGs program. My name is Emmanuel Olaoluoyo. I'm glad to also lead to this session with my cool um, members and also project teams. I can see Anita and also Esther on the call. Thank you for joining. And this evening, we are going to be moving straight to, to the session as we have our speaker on the call. Yeah, I really wish we could take some feedbacks this evening. However, I would always like to take one or two feedbacks from people, most especially yeah, most especially people that would like to say something that has to that's change them or transform them positively in line to the program, in line to the training, all the way from upper week. I think we've started like two weeks now. And yeah, it's very, very important we hear your testimony. And before we have our speaker start today's session, would you like to say something? And uh, please kindly raise your hand to our YouTube participants. You are not left behind. Please do make use of the comment session to share your feedback. Okay, I can see, let me start with Emmanuel from Ghana. Imane, please kindly unmute your mic and share your feedback. Let's hear your comment. How has it been program B? Has it been so far? You can unmute your mic and speak. Good evening. Um, it was uh, a nice experience, all the things I've learned so far. I would say uh, I actually started a program in my school to safeguard the climate change in the world. We started uh, with uh, using the gallons, the yellow gallons to do dustbins and coal. So it was moving on well. So I move forward to learn more and implement it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you for the feedback, Emmanuel. It's so good to hire that. All right, can we have Gloria Mary? Gloria Mary from Nigeria. Can you please unmute your mic and share your feedback with us? Gloria Mary. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, all. Um, you. The training has been very awesome. Even ye uh, yesterday's teachings, it was really awesome. Well, what I learned, the, the major quote I went home with that yesterday says, do what you have to do within the space you have. So everyone has a space. And certainly, that space may not please you as you thought. But if you can maximize that space, you will discover you achieve more. And you will help mm -hmm. in building our climate positively. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Within you, everybody has a space and we all need to make our impact across our various space. These are very good thoughts and um, perspective. And just like she has challenged us, she's also adding our own, our own quotes to that. We all have a space, you all have to make an impact within your own household, within your own community. Change starts from there. Okay, can we have a Koaba from Cameroon? Kindly unmute your mic and share your feedback. And just take, I think that might be the last one for this evening. Okay, good evening. Yeah, good evening, Nikwaba. Okay, thank you. I think the program has been so, uh, I don't know how I can put a word, but very interesting and so overwhelmed, so educative. Like from, for example, uh, I've been into SDGs as learning uh, half knowledge on SDGs, but I think this one has really enriched me. Like uh, where, where um, Dr. Agama said, our world, not my world, not your world. I got something from there. And then yesterday I also got something that it's not all about planting trees, but we need to start from our room. So I think 
but with the little knowledge I have on SDGs, I'm gaining a lot with this one. I want to say thank you for the program. Okay, thank you for the feedback and thank you for being so active in the program. We might not really be able to take much of feedback, but please would like to would like you share. You can share in the comment section your feedback. And those of us on YouTube, you can also use the comment section to share your feedback. Please, if you know your colleague that is not on the call yet, reach out to them, let them know that today's training has started. And this evening, we are going to be diving to another aspect that has to do with our professional, uh, professional progress and career. And we are going to be diving into an aspect that has to do with proposal writing and grant application. And I've on this, Leading this session is another industry expert in person of Dr. Charles, who is a business manager, published clinical researcher, um, entrepreneur, and LinkedIn optimization coach. He has gathered experience across networking, partnership, program execution, business operation, account finance, recruitment, talent management, and various leadership roles. Currently, the head of corporate operations and program at Afrimash, an agritech company with solutions for farmers, and is also a Fit Foundation volunteer and manages critical projects in collaboration with organizations such, such as USAID, GIZ, FOA, World Bank, Hanrai, Afrimash, and among others. Charles is an alumnus of, of University of Nigeria, Honsuka, University of Ibadan, Enterprise Development. Central Lagos Tequila Institute and Columbia Business School. We are so glad to receive you this evening, Dr. Charles. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Yes, I'm good evening, everyone. I don't know if I'm audible enough. Yes, you are audible. Okay, please let's make welcome Dr. Shaz as he's going to commence the session on proposal writing and grant application. I believe you have your notepads ready. I believe you have your jotters ready to gather information and learnings from this impactful session. Over to you, Dr. Shaz. Okay, so good one. I don't have Hello. Sorry, Dr. Charles, I don't know if you can hear me. I can't hear you from here. Hello, Hester, Hanita, can you have any feedback from your end? Or do you have any feedback from your hand? Okay, is it, is it better now? Okay, I guess it's better now. It's better okay. on the... Okay, okay, thank you. So, um, good, um, okay, I should, I should be... Good evening, everyone. Um, nice to be here um, as well. Um, please, Emmanuel, am I good to start? Yes, you are good to start. You can share your screen while okay, we okay. Make Thank the you. session. Okay, so please uh, let us know when um, you can see my screen. I'm, I'm sharing it now. Okay, all right, that, that's fine. Just a minute, please.
Okay, um, thank you. Um, good everyone. Uh, is it clear now? Mano? Hello? Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, Boniface, and thank you, um, everyone. Um, it's really, really nice to be here. Um, like, please, at any point in time, I'll be monitoring the chat. So, if by chance uh, my um, my voice goes off or something, just let me know. Okay, okay. So sorry. Okay, so um, so let me get started. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um proposal writing and grant applications, and then um, you might want to ask um, what's the I mean, what are the differences? Some people see uh, grant writing, some people see proposal writing and the likes. Um, are they kind of different? Are they the same? And um, this concept might mean different for oh. So I'm hearing my voice is not um, audible enough. Um, Imano, can you make a phone, please? Okay, so let me try to share my screen again. Oh, so sorry about that. Um, I'm I'm trying to share the slides again. Twenty. Of, so. Okay. Um. So is it is it better now, please? Okay, okay. So please, I, I sincerely apologize for this um, kind of um, network issues over here. And I make I've shared the slide already, so you should be able to um, see it now, or I can see it from here. Okay, thank you. I made it. So um, yeah, and like I said earlier, um, we are going to be talking about um, proposal writing and the uh, grant applications. And then for context, um, this could mean a lot of things in um, different industries. Um, for example, in the um. In the business industry and the likes, proposals kind of uh, mean differently, or grant applications mean differently, especially with regards of where the money is coming from or who we're applying to. Uh, for most of us, I believe we are. Um, okay, I think after this session, I'll share uh, the, uh, the slide with Emmanuel, so you'll probably email it to everybody. So, uh, for this particular part, since we both of us are you know, across African countries and they were probably you know, in the education sector or probably you know, working around them. With, um, with kids per se or students or I mean people that we kind of pass knowledge to. So um, it's very, very important that um, we kind of get the context of this, but uh, because of time, I have a video here that- uh, You're going to have an uncomfortable time with me. Yeah. Okay, I might okay. just have to My main slide point... the video because of time. So I'm going to, um, okay, uh, just a minute, please. Um, Okay, so yes, please. Um, so yeah, the slides will be shared um, after this session, please. So I know most of us have been asking, the slide is going to be shared. So it will be nice if you can pay um, attention. So um, for this, we're going to be talking about um, fundamentals of a um, proposal and grants. Um, at the next slide, in the next slide, I'm going to explain to us um, how, this, um, how this fits into the context of um, what we do as educators as well. And then as well, um, for, please, am I clear enough? I'm getting an audio feedback. Yes, we can hear you. We can okay, hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I'll just um, disregard the chat then. So, um, yeah, we'll be looking at them, um, also looking at funding and funders. And the basic part of this presentation is that we are all educators. It might not just be enough to, you know, teach students or teach people in the classrooms or in our institutions um, year in, year out. And, you know, we kind of see impacts that we could make, you know. It might not just be just focusing on the curriculum alone. There are a lot of things we could do. But at the end of the day, it's either the um, school system does not have enough funds to cover for something, or you've discovered a problem or a challenge somewhere, and then you're trying to access how um, you can make a difference. So sometimes in some school environments, uh, probably even if you are teaching um, you know, pupils at the um, primary school level, especially for those of us in Nigeria, or probably students at the secondary school level and the likes, it gets to a point in our lives whereby even as individuals, as business people, as teachers, you see 
we've seen areas in the society or in our systems whereby we can change, but at the end of the day, our financial monetary resources are not enough. So it's imperative for us to seek out those that are willing to help. And believe me, um, I believe after this session, I'll get to understand that um, from the from my experience, there's a lot of money in the system. So my, my main aim at this, I mean, for this session is to see how teach you how to position yourselves to be able to achieve these funds that are available for you to make that impact. People or organizations have money that they've kept aside for the kind of solutions they're going to bring or you're planning to bring tomorrow, but they probably don't know about you and you don't know about them. So this session is to see how the two of us can kind of come together and see that we're making this impact as fast as possible. So in our guide for today, we're going to be initially, and, um, we're going to be initially talking about the um, uh, fundamental and the program, discussing what proposals are, what grants are, are they different, are they the same? We're going to be talking about um, funding as well, you know, where are the funders, where are they located, what are the kind of things the funders are? Why is it that um, two people apply, maybe two of you in the same school or in the same location apply for funds, but one person gets it and the other person does not get it? That is focused on the expectation of the funders as well. The next one is looking at research. How do we find out where these funders are? What kind of relationship do they expect us to build? Um, I mean, same team, two or three of us in the same society or in the same school apply for the same grant at the same time, the same application and everything. But for some reason, even if we will be able to meet the, um, the expectations of the funders, but for some reason, one or two or three got it and we didn't get and we did not get it. So that is where the research and the relationships also come in. Then the fourth part, I mean, I had to start this from this more important part and then going to the grants. Then we're going to look at the basic components of um, grants application, as well as um, looking at post grant relationships. For for example, you've gotten the grants, you need $2 million, is it $500,000? Is it even um, $100,000 or $50,000? At the end of the day, what happens to the money? What happens to your project? How do you develop a relationship with the people that give you the money such that when that year or that session or that project is ended, they are willing to say, hello, James, or hello, Sam, or hello, Abkarim. There's still some money. Let's, let's continue. Okay. Okay, sorry, my screen just went off. Again. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, yeah, so um, I think, so these are just basically what is going to be guiding us um, for this. Um, so the next one is looking at, um, first one, looking at fundamentals of um, proposal writing and grant application. So by way of definition, um, you could probably see grant writing online. You would see um, proposal writing online. You would see grant application online. I doubt if you are going to see proposal application online. But then what are the differences? Are they the same thing? So from the definition here, a grant application is a specific request for funding from a grant provider. And this is, um, this is uh, monitored by a specific set of guidelines set by the grant provider and all grant applications have to be submitted. Now, um, how do you depreciate the grant application from proposal writing? For most grant applications, it is already set on stone. You have to be, I mean, there are, for example, um, to the Lumelu Foundation or Mastercard Foundation or Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we post it online on our website or so online there that there is 3 million naira available to eradicate malaria in Africa. If you have any solution or whatever, apply for the grant. That means the grant is already available there. You get the guidelines are there for you to apply for the grant. Make sure you are maybe a female-led business owner or you are an educator in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. You've been in the teaching system for that three or five years. You've impacted this and this and this. So that means just like uh, you're looking at for uh, a job application, for example. So grant application is more like a vacancy, but this time it's like a call to apply. So there's actually a set of them, specific set of guidelines. And if you're able to abide by those things, that is what can actually affect two people applying for the same thing, but one person seems to get it and the other person does not. But when it comes to proposal writing, proposal writing could be anything. And most times proposal writing is not specific or is not focused entirely on just getting money. Sometimes there could be proposal to have a designate or, it, um, or, or kind of a, a society member visit the community that could be proposal for getting some, some stuff in kind. So grant writing is also a part of proposal writing and proposal writing is also a part of the, uh, the grant application. When you are submitting a grant application, part of what you need to send is actually your proposal. Sometimes if you're in a business or the likes, you've probably been in business, whether it's a non-for-profit or for-profit or an NGO, it's also important to also send your business plan. And so, but the focus is looking at the kind of impacts you are going to make. So um, it's very important that we kind of get um, the terms clearly. 
so that um, as, as I'm making, as I'm proceeding with this, it's going to be important that we can follow. So uh, why, do you sh why should we do, so uh, for the context of this, I kind of labeled it grant proposal writing because you're looking at proposal writing, but it's tailored towards a grant you're applying for. So you're going to prepare the proposal for the grant and now use the proposal and apply for the grant. So we're going to take it together. So why should you as an educator, why should you as a teacher, why should you as a, maybe a society member that is interested in, you know, aligning with the SDGs, are you looking at food, are you looking at education, are you looking at them? Um, energy, climate, and the likes. Why should you want to apply for a proposal? Part of the I mean, purpose of proposal writing, first of all, and that is the most important part is actually funding. You have a solution or you have a project in your mind, and then you probably do not have enough financial resources for that. Then you have to go and start preparing proposals for funding to tell people that, okay, I need $2 million. I mean, I need $3 million for this project. If you give me the money, this is what I want, what I want, I'm going to do. Then um, another one could be actually, um, in terms of programs, this might not even be tailored towards funding. For example, I'm sure um, part of what Emmanuel and his team does is to you know develop programs. This program was probably packaged for educators looking at the teach for SDGs, still in the same system, um, AI and DEB. They could have two or three or four programs. They could probably even have a program that's tailored towards girl child education. They could have a probably tailored tailor towards uh, climate change. I mean, there are lots of SDGs for people to align to. So part of the grant proposal writing is to actually say, okay, um, this is, we've seen this SDG area, and we want to key into it as advocates, and these are the things we want to do. So that's why we want to develop programs as well. The funding are also part of the program. Another one could be in terms of um, resources, for example. So this time, I'm not even looking at the program, or you're not even looking at getting specific money, but you're looking at, okay, you need five, um, maybe five, um, maybe 500 units of a particular textbook for a particular classroom. Maybe you need school bags for a particular um, 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 set of students. Maybe even need technology, uh, probably maybe some mini laptops and then maybe some tech tools for your classroom. So when you need this kind of thing, you don't just go to a knock on someone's door and say, I need this. So you don't just send an email. You have to write a proposal requesting for that um, um, facility or services to yourself. Then the other one could also be innovation. I mean, it's not everything that has to be something really, really tangible by the code by your hand. In terms of maybe a teacher wants to go for training out outside the country or probably participate in a program like this to gain more knowledge that they can actually use to bring in innovative practices to the classroom. You can also need to write proposal for people to be able to fund your research or actually even fund your trip or your training. And yeah, it also comes with the same as um, professional growth as well. So let's not forget the grant application. You are actually applying for something that's already existing. Proposal writing, you are seeking for application for something that's already existing as well. Then um, Okay, sorry, my sliders. Sorry, it just keeps um, going up. Just a minute, please. Let me share again. Okay, just a minute. It's coming back soon. Yeah. Okay, so please, um, I think at the end of um, this session, um, Emmanuel is going to help us facilitate the question and answer part. So please, if you have questions, just note them down. But it's possible that um, I'll probably answer your questions as you go on with um, the application, I mean, with the, with the um, session. So next one, we're looking at funding, funders, and expectations. For context, I decided not to start telling us what proposals are, what proposal writing are, and all those other things, because you can actually get lots of information about this on YouTube, on social media, from our friends and the like. So, there are lots of materials online, but from my experience in, um, you know, working with some of the international organizations like um, World Bank, like the FAO, uh, USAID, and the likes, there have been, I mean, I've got to learn that there are some specific things, I mean, tips why 10 people can apply for a grant, and even the person that probably seems least qualified, or it could even be that a young person that is not even in the educational sector can actually get that grant. Meanwhile, you that you've been in the sector, you know, teaching for 10, 15, 20 years with all the experience, you're unable to get it. So that is why this slide is, I mean, this, the next two or three slides are very, very important because it focuses on what kind of funders, I mean, how do we get funding and what are the expectations? Like we identified earlier, we are all, you know, basically um, we are humans, we are society members, we are based in Africa, we are looking at them, um, are, you know, um, championing SDGs in Africa, which means there are lots of, um, you know, lots of options for us to kind of explore into, I mean, to kind of make an impact. And that means, most of what these things are, we don't, can't, I mean, we're we are unable to use our personal funds to do stuff like this. So at the end of the day, we need to package projects, you know, package services and the likes and see how to get this kind of funders. But one important thing, um, and then during the context of this, I'll be giving us some things that might not be in the slide. 
one important thing is that Dan Gote said there's two million are available for a particular grant does not necessarily mean that grant is for you. So if you randomly apply for grants without even identifying who the funders are and what they're interested in, then it's going to be very challenging. For example, um, in some years, I mean, some years ago, being a Melinda Gates, you are really interested in some changes in Africa with the context of eradicating malaria in Africa. So you probably brought a, you know, a solution per se in terms of maybe AI five or six or seven years ago. That was not really the trajectory of the world back then. But even if it was as far as Bill and Melinda, Melinda Gates Foundation were interested for Africa, they were looking at malaria. So if you probably bought, you know, distributing mosquito nets, access to malaria drugs, access to maternal health care, you know, to uh, attend to child mortality, access to a lot of other things that was basically going to answer that problem that if I do this, it's going to do plus one or add one or two or three things to make it easily achievable to eradicate, um, you know, the incidence of malaria and the likes in Africa. That means if Big Gates says that he has $20 million for eradicating malaria in Africa, according to SDG, this and this, and the own solution is for AI or for a technology too that has no impact in any way as at that particular directive that the um, that bill is looking at, then even if you decide to apply, by the time I'm looking at the guidelines, you're not even going to qualify. And that's why you could actually apply for that. You're not going to get it. So it's not just about looking for anyone that comes to you to do what you want to do most times. It's actually very, very important that you choose yourself the kind of people you are looking to fund your initiative per se. So in this, we are going to be looking at funders and um, funders and the expectations. First of all, we're going to be looking at uh, individual donors. Individual donors could be um, individual donors could be anybody. You know, it could be your uncle, it could be your aunt, it could be angel investor, people that just feel okay. James or Shola or Usman or Abdurrahman, I like what they're doing. I find that they're interested in this area of whatever. I'm willing to support you and the likes. It could be money, per se. It could also be in kind support. For example, maybe you want to clean the environment or you want to, you know, uh, paint a classroom or something. And maybe a company or an organization or even a person in the community. It could be a local government chairman or a politician says, okay, I'm going to mobilize some of my guys or some of my kids or some of my community people to come and assist you in the program. So when it comes to um, that of funders, individual donors are also a part of this. Then another set again is going to be corporations. Corporations are looking at probably lots of foundation, maybe the Tunnel Mill Foundation for those of us in Nigeria and aspects of Africa that have gotten impacts on this. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, like the Mastercard Foundation, there are lots of foundations like this in, in, in Nigeria, in Africa, and all over the world. And then um, I also included the marketing departments because most corporate organizations have a um, kind of um, you know CSR, corporate social responsibility, giving back to the communities. So that means some companies have a budget that have been earmarked for um, for programs like this, and it's very important that they kind of exhaust that budget. So, as against them looking out of who they are going to fund, if you do your research, you could actually find out what corporations or what companies are earmarked or have, I mean, have this part of them. For example, if it's probably uh, looking at them, all companies in the southern part of Nigeria, a big part of their um, CSR covers, um, you know, taking care of the environment based on the pollution being um, affected there and the like. So, if you're packaging a, you need a packaging an initiative that looks at, you know, cleaning the environment you know, and all those other things, you can easily align to them. So, by the time you send the set a proposal, your proposal and their um, funding availability or the grant availability kind of align um, align a lot for, for them and then it's very, very easy for them to come into. But then, for the context of foundation, let me just touch on this a bit. There are different foundations and it's very, very important for you to read about what the foundation is all about. If a foundation says that they're focused on disaster relief or uh, managing disaster um, areas, for example, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, some other organizations that are key on, um, you know, maybe whether it's war or some unusual catastrophe and the likes, you know, probably environment um, disruption and the likes, that is where their main aim is. If you're probably bringing in a packaged um, project or, you know, you want to write a proposal for something that doesn't like, maybe you're looking at them. Um, buying laptops for people, you know, maybe uh, sanitary pads for uh, young female students and the likes, but not really aligned with what they are doing. So it's very, very important that as you're looking at these funders, you try to um, do your research to find out what are they interested in. And there are lots of resources online. You can just Google them and see everything they are on. You can check their website, you can check their LinkedIn pages, their social media pages. By the time you even see one or two or three pictures of the kind of impact they are making, that you kind of understand where they're into. And also, yeah, private and independent uh, foundation. This one are not really aligned. So, uh, an independent foundation could be just, you know, a foundation that comes up on its own. For example, the Tony Limeli Foundation, I'm going to be using one of them as an example. 
Um, I hope um, yeah, I'm going to present some of them as example. For example, are not um, aligned. I mean, they are aligned basically to a particular person that has, um, you know, that has a calling per se to effect some changes in the society. So other organizations and the like are probably standing out on their own. They are not, for example, Mastercard Foundation is aligned to Mastercard. Shell Foundation is aligned to Shell Foundation. If they had the World Bank, um, World Health Organization Foundation is going to be aligned to that. So that we also independent foundation, but everything is going to be um, available on their website. And yeah, they also community foundations. If there's a maybe a foundation or um, an initiative that is focused on maybe northern Nigeria or Cardona or Nairobi or you know uh, Ethiopia or whatever foundation and the likes, these are what we call community foundations in the context of the fact that not necessarily on a national level, but they are geographically limited. So if you're looking at here in Nigeria and there's a foundation in Ghana, for example, let me say in Kumasi that is looking at solving one or two or three problems there. It's, it's going to be very, very, you probably have to smarten your way around that because if you're looking at, you know, affecting the same thing in Nigeria, there is looking at aspect of commerce and that can be very, very challenging. So it's typically, um, if someone that has a project in commerce, it can actually align more to that because that the effect of that project is uh, focused more on a particular geography. So for example, you build a Melinda Gates, they might be in the US or the UK, but then their project or their foundation has an aspect that's packaged for eradicating malaria in Africa. So if you're in Asia and you're applying for the malaria eradication in Africa, it might not really apply to you. Then there are also government agencies could be from, you know, political basis, you know, grants to maybe build new schools and um, put books and all those other things. So this list is not exhaustive, but it kind of gives you some of the um, some of the categorizations of funders that we have. That means you could see one person and you know where the person falls into, a typical company falls into somewhere and the legs. And then when we're looking at types of funding, there are lots of... Um, different funding types out there, you know, lots of different funding types out there. For example, for most of us educators, the kind of funding category, categorization they are going to see is going to be a bit different from maybe that of um, a company that's making money, a profit driven company, a competitive from an NGO and the likes. But generally, most funding types are going to be, I mean, they are broken down into the program specific funding or grants per se. Now, let me use let me just use funding, as well as the general operational support. When it comes to program-specific funding, it's directed to a defined set of activities. If you say you want to, you need um, $100,000 to buy sanitary pads for girl children to get school uniform for children in a particular geography, that is a program-specific support. If um, the organization championing this says, you know, they are doing a program like this for um, educators in Africa, that is a program-specific funding support. It's set to defined activities. The proposal is going to be packaged, selling the idea of what they want to do for us to the people that are going to give them the money. And there are going to be areas of monitoring and evaluation to say that, okay, if we give you money for this, they are doing it exactly that way. So you don't have as much liberty to do anything with your money. That means if you say you want to do this and then you get the money and decide you can be buying a car, especially if the car is not part of the initial budget that is sent, it might actually affect how your relationship with the fund that's going to continue in the future. So some typical examples for... Um, Program specific support, you know, you have maybe a STEM workshop for students, you know, you may have to do a jet club, or you want to do science, technology, and the likes. For example, if you're into art, you want to, but not even into art, if you want to maybe holiday lessons, purchase art supplies for a creativity program in the school, you're getting funding from almost any of the funders up here, or you want to organize a field trip to a science museum, maybe an excursion, or, you know, maybe to visit to uh, maybe um, a regional leaders, how, and all those kind of things. So, the money I'm asking for, the money you need, is specific to a particular program, and it has to be aligned to that program. But then also looking at the types of funding, there are also the general operational support funding. These ones are flexible. You could say, I have a primary school or a secondary school, and we need um, $50,000 to be able to do a B, C, D, E. So there might not be specific um, you know, checks and balances to make sure you're using it exactly like that, but at the end of the day, you have a general overview of what you want to do. Enhance of our teaching quality, how the environment of our teaching quality. You want to make sure that teachers are better trained, the classrooms are better equipped, you know, the spacing in the classroom, you know, probably the class that should contain 45 students, you're probably looking at 50 or 60 or 70, and all those other things. So, in terms of this kind of general and operational support, it's flexible to use. I say for those of us in Nigeria, um, something like uh, Tony Lumelu Fund, for example, I'm um, so I'm still going to present that as an example. If they're giving $5,000, you just, you know, give a proposal at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, there are no specific sets of, hey, you say you, might, you are doing this, you must do it. So it's more like a generalized operational support. You want to start up a business, you want to do this, and you want to do that, and then send a business plan and that you apply. So that's a general, you know, they're going to be having different aspects. For example, the company I work in, 
we started with Tony Lumelis Fund um, some years, I mean, some years ago. That's a general support. You know, we used to start up the company, you know, get our website, go in, hire some staff, paid for an office and all those other things. So the more not like, you want to start a business, I think you have a very good, very, very good business plan. Take this money and keep go on with this. And that was something like that. But still over the years, as we keep expanding, we said, okay, we are now interested in you know, supporting farmers in Northern Nigeria. World Bank said, okay, they have a project in Northern Nigeria and they have this amount of funding available. Will they apply? We applied and we were able to get that. Same thing with TSID and other aspects and the like. So this is a company that started with a general operational funding to start to build up a company. And at the end of the day, when I decided to start getting into program specific, you could get general funding to start up a school or, you know, maybe a lesson or a, a co-op or a co-working space or just anything. And at the end of the day, stream over to the um, to the program side. So generally, when it comes to most funders, and then from my experience, I've kind of um, related with a lot. So, I mean, lots of funders across, especially those that are into the due diligence aspect, into the finance aspect, into the general partnership aspect. These are just some of the things I've learned so far. Firstly, is, um, your budget has to be very, very detailed to the letter. Most funders, um, especially if you're applying for grants, sometimes, and yeah, it's also very important, sometimes they have a template of their budget. So if you are probably preparing a Microsoft Word document of five or six tables and you say, um, you give me um, $20,000, you know, um, operations here, marketing here, this one here, purchase, procurement, and all those things, and then at the end of the day, they don't work with that kind of format. So there's a specific set of um, of uh, metrics or data that they need. So most times these days, some of them actually are applying they will give you access to, to know, some of them actually tend to send a proposal first. Once you send a proposal, now you kind of go over to the next stage. You now give you access to a better grant application platform, usually on their website, and you'll be able to download the templates of the budget and send, I mean, and then download it and work with it. And then it depends, you could be the, um, the um, principal of the, or the head teacher of a school, you could be a teacher in a school. This can actually affect some of the kind of funding that's going to be made available. So for example, for, those of us in Nigeria, the uh, tertiary education um, trust fund and the likes is, um, is, is not usually specific to a particular individual most times. It's actually looked, I mean, focused on an organization or the university or public department in the university and cannot filter in. So the major reason is that if as an individual you're applying for some of these things, you might not even have enough history. A university should have had enough history of, you know, we've gotten five funds, we've been in existence for five years, there have been enough data to show. So that means these are the kind of things that can actually affect kind of access to funding that some of us get. But budget and then um, budget is very, very important. And how you're going to spend it is very, very important. Very, very important. This is one part that you don't want to miss out. Very, very important as well. The logic model, model talks of um, a very, very good example. There's a school, probably a school in Payasa, and, you know, you're looking at probably... Um, Maybe whereby you want to distribute some um, educational materials to the students and the likes. And then the company said that, you know, they want to, um, they are funding, you know, just, just, it has to kind of match, per se, because, you know, some people, um, and then this is from my own experience, most of the funders um, available are having issues, especially when it comes to some companies or some applications in Nigeria, because there's a common fear that um, some people usually want to apply for funding and at the end of the day, they get that money and they don't use that money for what they still don't do. So the logic model has to make sense. If they see there, I mean, if there's a grant available for solving a problem in Cardona State specifically, and you're bringing a grant application for solving a problem in Enugu State, it's not going to fly because it doesn't align with what the organization said they want. So that means that funder, that, that grant application is not for you. You might actually want to go for the marketing department of a company that is looking at CSR activities in any good state, for example, or something different. So what your goals are and what your outcomes are expected and your expected outcomes are very, very important. And this must align to what the funder wants. Very, very important, what the funder wants. Then past performance examples, it depends. That means, for example, if you're a teacher and you've not applied for a funding before, you get, so you might not have enough history to say, I've gotten this money, I've done this, I've done this. What you can do is to start packaging all the things you're doing. You know, have you um, started up a mini group in your school? Have you done some activities, maybe environmental cleaning? Are you part of a volunteer group? Are you part of an NGO? Have you done some community activities? These are some of the things that you can package without necessarily having access to a phone before. They can even make you well positioned. Why? Because, okay, because not only is the fact that you are, um, um, that you are also in the system, there are two teachers. One goes to school and goes back home and sees the funding and wants to apply. And the other teacher has focused himself or herself into the community, you know, belong to organizations, has enough pictures and enough impact to prove that they can do this thing. So that means they've been doing it 
albeit in a group, and this time I don't start it up differently. So that can make up for past performances. It's like a student that graduates from school and is looking for a job. And at the end of the day, you know, you finish school, you do not do uh, probably any um, side jobs or, you know, industrial training and industrial attachments while you're in school. But so, and then you're looking for a job. That means your CV is probably going to be as scanty as possible. And then you say, okay, I'm in school. I was not expected to work. And now you're out, you're a graduate, but you have zero experience. But so the senior that from his first year in the university, you know, joined an NGO, joined this group, or probably active in his church or his mosque or his religious affiliation, you know, became very, very busy. At the end of the day, this student graduates and he has enough CVs that might even have a lot of volunteer roles, but that offers him a better job opportunity because while he or she were in school, they were there having access to learning and development and the like. So this is how past performance as a teacher, even though you've not had experience getting funding before, can actually help you. And this also covers the second, I mean, this, um, the fourth point in proving track records. I'm sorry, my slide just went up again. Let me share. Just a minute, please. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So um, this and um, the fourth part also talks about you know proving track record for success. You know, looking at the history of what you perform. Now I'm 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 giving this in a broad sense because I believe there are teachers here. I believe there are educators here. I believe there are probably even head tech entrepreneurs here, probably those that are looking at using tech solutions for education. There might even be head teachers here or school owners here, but basically impact um, you know, society members here as well. So I'm going to give it, make it as broad as possible. But in terms of this, it's just important that we kind of take it in context of the kind of system they are into. Then the last part, which is very, very important, is going to talk about collaboration, partnerships, and networking. Most times, it's very, very challenging for funders to give money to people that they do not have any alignment with. For example, one tip I will give to most of us, especially if you are starting, is that if you are applying for a particular grant, what I personally do for my company where I work and then for some other, other grants I've applied is I do my research into the organization. Out of the five or six or seven funders in my sector or aligned to the ATGs I'm interested in, which of them does my project align with? I get like two of them. I go over to LinkedIn. Because sending code emails work, but then there are lots of emails that they like. And when it's in the application phase, it's almost very, very difficult for people to start creating lots of emails because they're actually focused on people submitting the application. So from, from, from my, to the best of my knowledge, emails might not be one of the best tools. LinkedIn is a very, very important tool. And I think I really want to sell it to us here. Whatever I are doing, especially if you're focused a lot more on impact, it's very, very important to be on LinkedIn. It's one of the best ways to push you to the funders because LinkedIn gives you access to even the um, CEO or the programs manager of any of these foundations and the likes. For example, one of the best ways to meet a man might actually be on LinkedIn. You know, you send him a message on LinkedIn, he checks out your profile, sees your picture, sees how, how busy you've been, and now knows how to contextualize the response. But also, you want to probably try WhatsApp or a phone call and the likes, and it's almost very, very difficult to sell. So it's very important to package your LinkedIn profiles and start reaching out to people. So you know, you want to follow the organization to start with. On the you know, study some of the things they've posted, look at the activity, then go to the people part and probably start sending connection requests to some of the key decision makers. They're probably looking at the project manager of the organization, you know, the um the marketing manager, like I said, marketing departments have a very, very big part playing aspects like this. They want to probably send to the CEO and they're like, this is a, a kind of sharing, um needing the haystack kind of thing, but it offers you more advantage because by then it kind of become a familiar face. So you can even start chatting with some of them to get some of the things that they need. Sometimes when I'm attending networking events, especially when we've gotten some funding, what I do to research the people that I'm expecting to see there, I go over to LinkedIn, I send them requests and try to engage with one or two or three of them. By the time I get there, I'm not a stranger. It's not like, oh, yeah, Charles, you chatted me up on LinkedIn or we connected on LinkedIn. And like, so there's already a level of familiarity. So before I go for these things, I'm already making friends already. So I don't think you don't even need to go for physical events to have access to stuff like this. But please, um, if you're listening to me, I think we have over 260 people here. It's very, very important as yeah, an SDG champion that we all are, as SDG champions rather that we all are, to be on LinkedIn. It's one of the best tools. For example, if I were to take a course on, uh, I recently took a course on, I think, um, gender inequality and the likes of yearly. And, you know, when I'm done, I go back to LinkedIn and I post my certificate and I tag them. Hello, Yali, at Yali, I'll tag them. Thanks for this course. It helped me achieve this and this. And this. These are some of the things I'm doing. What happens is that Yali gets a notification that Charles in Nigeria tagged them for this. Oh, 
there's a chance in Nigeria to took our course. Some of us take courses and we just post anywhere and leave it. Or we post on LinkedIn and we don't even let people know that we took their courses. So this is very, very important. Sometimes it's even important that um, we have to do a community um, engagement exercise. Took your maybe five or ten of your students to the community to engage people, or maybe um, you know, the road transport network and the like, you know, using your seat belts or cleaning the environment and all those other things. You take pictures. Where do those pictures go? It's not, it's, I mean, it's not bad enough that they agree to your website. If you have a website, they post them on your WhatsApp status. Now, the funny thing is that the decision makers that need to help you, not help you actually to collaborate with you in future, are not on your WhatsApp status. They are not on your Facebook. They are not on your Instagram. They are not even in your circle. Now, one of the best ways to get access to these guys is to use your LinkedIn profile. So when you have a very, very good profile, you know, hello, LinkedIn family or something. My team and I went out to this community in this state to do this and this and this. These are the pictures. My organization or myself, we are one of I me, mean, we are very, very um, focused on aligning with SDG that says, you know, be the picture or do this or that. This small activity we've done is a way of adding to this, you know, you know, package it so well and tag the necessary people. Believe me, I've tried this lots of times and my company has had access to lots of, I mean, this, the, what a manner of the, all these organizations. I'm telling you that between February to this, I had access as that. Ending of January, I, I hardly knew anybody in these organizations, but in the less than six months, not only did I have access to the key decision makers, I started getting invites to lots of events, and that's how I was able to get to the level to start teaching and speaking to um, people about something like this. So these things are very, very key. LinkedIn should be your best friend. That is why I said earlier on there are three teachers or three educators or three people that applied for the same funding or applied for something, and at the end of the day, one person that is probably not even attending the classroom has probably teaching remotely because of you that you've been in the field and been on the ground doing all the work. That person seems to get it. Why? Depends on how you package it. It's very, very important. So the first three or four slides I've looked at is instead of talking to us about proposal writing that most of us have heard, let me tell you why you are not getting that money. You are not even passing through to the next stage because you are not meeting with the expectations of your funders. So people give money or people network with people that they know. If they don't know you, how will you make them to know you? You're in Kumasi, you're in Ashanti, you're in Nairobi, you're in um, probably South Africa or somewhere else, in the comfort of your house, in the comfort of a local community, probably not even done much or gone out. You don't have as much friends or network as you like. But from the comfort of that, your house or wherever you are, you can do your project and package it and use LinkedIn as a, as a springboard. And at the end of the day, you get DM. Very important because I've worked on a lot of people's um, LinkedIn accounts. You know, package it so well that somebody says, hi, Jennifer or hi James or hi John, for example. And um, I just saw your post. I'm really interested in aligning with your partner with you on that this project. When are you having a project? Send me a proposal. So in, in the context of HR, for those of us that are into recruitment and the likes, that's what we call headhunting. Headhunting means you've positioned yourself so well on LinkedIn, you've not applied for a job. There's a job out there, and the HR or the headhunter or the talent manager reaches out to you and say, hello, Emmanuel, hello, Samson. I saw your profile. I like your profile. There is this job. I feel you'll be well positioned for this job. Please apply for this job. So when you position yourself, that is what you need. Apart from putting yourself in the faces of people, let the guy that have the money that don't even know that they need to, in front of people, invite you to send a proposal to them. And it's also very important that they already have a proposal done because by the time I'm taking a whole week to package a proposal and send, it's going to be a major challenge. So please, this part is very, very important um, as well. The next part I'm going to be looking at is looking at um, how do we research these funders? How do we research grants? Where are these grants even located? How do we get them? And how do we manage relationships with the, I mean, with the um, funders? I've talked a lot um, about the funders already. So now I'm going to be focusing on researching your proposal. You no, know, we've talked about you know, what grants are, you know, on maybe Bill and Melinda Gate system and the likes. Very important. The grants are there already. There are lots of grants available. Then, what the people that posted those grants or what those guys that have the money that, uh, I mean, let me, uh, the funds, let me use funds, not money. I think funds is a better term to use. The funding available, what they need and why it is that you've been applying for time stamp but you've not been getting it. We talked about those funds. Now we're slowly going down to the basics. That is preparing a research proposal. You don't just wake up and go online and get any, I mean, any um, resource online or any downloadable material and start. It has to be very, very strategic. I, 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 I kid you not, if you plan it very well, you can have a very, very good funding option with USAID or even Mexico. There are lots of them out there. And then you start getting funding from them month on month on month, quarter on quarter, year on year. That means you don't even almost need money from any other person. 
because they are so interested in your solution and they are seeing the results that they are willing to even sign up five year extensive contracts with you to be able to start partnering with you. But see, so that is one of the key things that I want. I'm going to teach us how we get to that stage. For research and proposal, I've talked about it. Find the right funder. Not every funder is for you. There are lots of them. On if you decide to go to LinkedIn and search foundation and filter it to Nigeria, you see that there are over probably, and let me not um, see it too much, but over 100 foundations in Nigeria, as at the height of the insurgency in the Northeast, a bulk of NGOs and foundations started springing up. And believe me, there's enough funds to go around because even the world food, whatever, to, to uh, 2030, we need everybody to put their hands in place. So the moment you have an initiative to do, very, very important. So there are many funders available. There are lots of funds available. There are lots of grants available. You have to find the right one for you. If you're into, um, if you're into technology, for example, and another person is into environment, for example, and you want to key into it. Now you have to ask yourself, you're not just going to go and say AI or tech or laptops or whatever. How will technology enable environments? You want to have an early warning system that maybe an alarm goes off to show that, you know, um, that um, there's a flood coming or whatever, whatever. But there are too many things to go. My company, for example, we're into agri-tech. We're into agri-tech and at the end of the day, we are like a tech company, an agricultural company that is technology or a technology company that is agriculture. But believe me, we've gotten funding from those interested in climate, those interested in technology, those interested in agriculture, and like because of how we've packaged our different programs. So it's very, very important, apart from finding the right funder, adhere to their guidelines. If they say you must be 30 and above, you must be a female, for example, those that are support, I mean that are into the gender and um, equity and the likes, your project must be specific to northern Nigeria or northern Canada, Kenya or northern Nigeria and the likes. Very, very important. Then also, um, Past funding partners and alignment to funder is This is another important thing. If a funder has been focused on funding, for example, let's say Bill and Melinda Gates, they are focused on funding, you know, mosquito nets or you know, um, um probably um uh, organic insecticides. Um, and you know, basically, you know, cleaning the environment, just making sure that you know the um, incidence um, of um or reported cases per se of um, malaria or even mortalities from children or women or in this general society for malaria is, is reducing to a drastic minimum. That's what they're interested in. So in your research, you find out where have their money gone to in the past. It's very, very easy. Most of us online, you come online and I see young guys and young ladies with fine black t-shirts with nice logos and nice names on them holding huge checks. Once you see those kind of pictures, go and search for that. Who are these guys? What did they do? How did they do it? How much did they get? Who gave them that money? That's how you're going to know the funding pattern of these kind of people. So by the time, apart from finding the right funder, go deep and find out who are those they're giving the money to. For context, most bigger corporations and bigger funders put out what they call an official announcement. So the moment um, the US government, for example, decides to give you 50 million naira, I mean 50 million dollars for a particular project. You saw my slide has gone off again. Just a minute, please. So while I do this, by the time um, people like um, the US government have given you, I mean, they've told you that, okay, congrats, Emmanuel. Or congrats, um, Iran, or congrats, um, um, something or Jibola or something. You've been awarded um, fifty thousand naira, or you are part of those that gotten this award. It's very, very important that you do not go out, to start mentioning it or posting it online, because there are some terms and conditions in this kind of contact. You have to verbally or officially communicate to you via email. Hello, go ahead and post. Sometimes they even give you the format of what to post. Because they just told you that you got it. They are not done with their due diligence or other part. They still have to do some other things. Sometimes they even do onboarding. The onboarding means, for example, you need to you know, send your company account. Yes, um, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, Matthew, there are terms and conditions, obviously. So you know, you need to have a company account. Sometimes they'll tell you to open a euro account, a dollar account, or a, 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 a GBP account. You know, they tell you so one or two or three things. They have to align it. Sometimes for some of this funding, sometimes they could tell you that, okay, what you want to do, divide it into four. Finish the first part, shows the result. Once you see it, we pay you the first part, finish the second part. So those are the terms and conditions. So it's very, very important. In case the organizations do not tell you to go ahead and post, be very, very careful. Seek their permission before you go to campus. If not, it might be a kind of going away from the terms and conditions or the terms of the contract. I remember that most times the terms and conditions are so much and in tiny form that it's almost very, very difficult to see. And most of all those click, I agree. So please, uh, some people have made these kind of mistakes in the past and they've been knocked out. Of the program, so it's very important that you don't announce it officially until you do. So most of they've announced it on their websites, on their platform, and you now copy or repost or share it on your website or your own system. That I mean that gives you enough credibility. 
when the US government posts your name or your company's name or your organization's name on their website, but if you just pushing it randomly on WhatsApp or Facebook. So this kind of thing actually does um, help a lot. And then I've also talked about um, geographic relevance. Very important. If a funding or a grant or a system is focused on, for example, this program now is looking at um, um, educators in Africa. Someone that's trying to package something for educators in um, in uh, maybe Asia or in Southern America cannot easily align themselves with this one at this point, except if they package something a bit different. So that geographic relevance is very, very important. So also looking at them, um, how about in your proposal, your grant you want to apply for and the likes? How are you going to find them? First off, it's government and ministries. You know, there are new governments coming in, ministers are coming up, you know, um, local governments are coming up, different organizations are coming up. A new governor could come in and say, okay, as far as I'm concerned, I'm interested in um, encouraging the, uh, you know, the road network. I feel one, the roads are okay, everybody's looking at the legs. So that means the manifesto or the plans of the government is looking at it, I mean, the road network. That means those are probably very, very smart or into that sector of staff packaging align with the, in line with that. So government administrators, you can check in with the authorities there if it's allowed to have access to some of the information available. Then there are international development groups have had enough experience with um, this particular set of groups. You know, UNESCO, um, there is the UNICEF, development banks and the likes. And believe me, your idea of funders has to be revamped per se. Because even a bank, even, even a business, anybody that has a CSR option or whatever can actually go into, you know, give, giving back to the community. So, I mean, normally my public expect banks are just focused on exchange of money or safeguarding money, but then the bulk of, it's especially for even the agricultural sector and the agricultural sector come from the banks, very, very important. So, like I said, that easy way, instead of even going to their website, which might not even be as systematic to you as it should be, Go to that LinkedIn page. For example, UNESCO, you want to go to UNESCO's, UNESCO's LinkedIn page, follow UNESCO. Not to go to UNESCO's LinkedIn page, follow UNESCO, you know, filter to the people there. You, know, you want to probably send, okay, there's a, probably there's a general manager or the head of UNESCO for the world is based in Rome. You might not have access to him because of the level he is, but then there might be a content manager for UNESCO in Nigeria. There might be a state representative for UNESCO in your state or your locality. If you want to place it to, decision makers that actually have access to you and the letter and start engaging with them and asking questions. So that is how you can get it. Then um, it, it, the third one is looking at foundations, non-governmental organizations and the likes. And I've mentioned this one, thank you, and the likes. So, you know, I mean, the just could come up, maybe when they're retiring or silver jubilee or golden jubilee and the likes, a set of foundations that are looking at, you know, there's a sum of money that has had a lot give back to the community. So it's very, very important. But believe me, all this is one of the best bets for most of these things are actually through LinkedIn. Then another one is online data based search. I've been, I did a bit of research. I was able to get some of this stuff. So some options like this, what it is that they have sets of filters. So for example, you go to grantfinder.com. At the end of the day, you say, okay, which sector are you interested? Maybe which SDG are you interested? You say, okay, education aspect, okay. Education, you know, each of the SDGs you are seeing, it's not just that. If you do your search for that, each SDG has its own further sub SDGs, if I call it that, which is almost very, very difficult to say you want to end, end them. Uh, world food, how you go to end world food? You know, if someone decides to start designing plates and making it easy or, you know, biodegradable plates, you know, not, so there are lots of things to do into those things. So, it's so, okay, the SDG 2 or SDG 3, next one, which part of it, next one, where is your lo location? What is, you know, ask you one or two or three or four or five questions and once you're done with it, it now filters and gives you the set of grants or um, options available for you to apply that fit into what you want. So, it's one of the places that technology and technology is actually helping us get access to grants. Then education associations, very important. Maybe it's an alumni association or you know, educational groups, universities and the likes. If you're a lecturer or a teacher, and then you have a very, very strong alumni um, system in your school, or you know, for example, those of us that are probably lecturers, those that are lecturers and the like, maybe the third fund and every other fund available for school. These are some of the ways you can get it. But then it's almost very, very difficult to access some of these things if you are not a member of an organization because there are lots of exclusive options as well. Then NGOs and embassies for some of us that have kind of been um, have experience with the US embassies, the um, Dutch embassies, you know, very, very important. Networks and forums, uh, you know, where um, lots of options like that, then local institutions. And also for context, in terms of the NGOs and embassies, embassies are also one of the best ways minus the international development groups to have access to um, foreign-based um, projects you can work on. You know, they're the Save the Children. I think the uh, Dutch consulate, especially in Lagos, Nigeria, and Abuja, Nigeria, there's, they are partnering with, um, I think, Faith Foundation and a particular program called Orange Corners. You know, there's the current one that we're on now, Teach for Institutes. And so there are lots of them 
I like the belonging to this association to actually offer you a better advantage to having access to some of you. So if you use this slide to talk about them um, in your research, uh, looking at the top of the slide, your research will actually help you save time, intentionally, I mean, strategically, I mean, position your proposal strategically as well as give a very, very strong impression to the people that actually. So if you've taken this lesson or if you've been in this class and taking enough notes, but so someone that did not take enough notes or had a word, they don't have any knowledge of this. When it's office and the proposals, I'm going to see a lot of difference in it. And that's how you get to know that you've taken as much as you can from this session. So next one, we're actually going into the um, basic components of grants proposals. Remember I said proposals and grants, I mean, they're almost this kind of same thing and similar or what, depending on how you get to look at it. But these are looking at how you position yourself as a teacher without them um, and all those other things to be able to have, have access to this. So um, key proposal elements, if you check online, there are lots of models available. Some are not, some are talking about, you know, company overview, some are talking about projects, some are talking about um, summary, some probably even call it an abstract and the likes. This are, I'm just, I, so I, I, I was very careful as against using the particular terms. I just use the general term to kind of describe these things. But then, like I said earlier, most organizations that are applying for their grants and the like, they, they will give you templates to follow. So it's very important to align. So if I'm saying narrative section, and this is a narrative section that's saying a company summary or an overview of the company or an abstract or whatever, whatever, please, it's very important to align with that. So usually most proposals start with a general story, you know, give them a narrative, you know, and it's just like you're preparing a CV, you know, it's, it's, it's not advisable to have a CV and a single cover letter for five or six or seven jobs. So imagine um, there's an engineering job, one into the health sector, one in the education sector, submitting the same CV just kind of disqualifies because it looks like you're not even aligned to what the recruiters want. So when you've done your research very, very well, it's important that your narrative should apply. If you are an education, I mean, into the educational sector, you have a project and the project is focused on, you know, probably stopping, um, you know, probably um, ensuring child safety. In, I mean, ensuring that maybe there are probably issues of accidents or challenges to students accessing the school and maybe want to be the bridge or, you know, we'll do one or two or three things. And that is what the fund has said they're interested in. Not just, they maybe they're not interested in even giving gifts to kids, but ensuring that, you know, access to education is very important. That access could be ensuring that schools are available, even ensuring that maybe in flooded communities, for example, there could be some communities that flood is not allowing these pupils to, you know, go around and, you know, a lot of other options. You have to tailor your proposal to what the funders want. That means by the time I give you a narrative about your company or your organization or your project, it should align with what they want. So you can use the same company or yourself alone to apply to three or five or six different uh, funding or proposals and ensure that they align. They are not expected to be the same because there are actually some keywords that they're actually looking towards. Then it's also important that um, your narrative should be solution centric. When you say that um, there are 50 million youths without job in Nigeria, there are 200 students that are whatever that these are. Those are very, very good figures. They are quite high, but they can be very, very bogus. Your solution is not going to ensure that malaria ends in Africa today. In fact, they might not even ensure that malaria ends in your community today. But actually, what's in your little way? So let's use an example, access of kids to, um, to education. Somebody could decide that he wants to make remote learning available for students in communities that do not have access to good old network. It's very, very weird to conceptualize that, but that tells you that this actually helps. I mean, this is a tech person thinking of how can I align with this? What can I do? He's not going to the classroom to teach, but he has designed a solution to make it like, okay, you are in a far place, you cannot actually go to your school. We've designed a laptop or maybe a small device that has access to the internet that you can stay comfortably in your house and use it and you have access, you know, to position a camera behind the class, I mean, behind the teacher and the person access it. That's the way a tech person has packaged access to education for himself. Somebody could find out that he's not a teacher or whatever, but he finds out that maybe particular school, the bridges are bad or the, I mean, the road network is kind of very bad and he decides to start, you know, making probably better road options or getting money to probably putting, um, you know, lots of stuff. For example, it could be that maybe um, because of the lighting and the like, probably the evening activities in the school, evening lessons and the like, maybe there are young cases of theft or kidnap and the like, and someone decides to come and put street lights available in that particular community from the school, so probably the town center or probably a place that is very, very safe for the children. That is the same way somebody has packaged the same thing, but in a different format. So I think as educators, it's important that when we're packaging um, our project, let's not just align to, you know, the teaching classroom, classroom, classroom. It goes lots and ways beyond that. And then, like I said, 
the last part of our narrative, emphasize on sustainability. Sustainability means if you ask for $2,000 for this project and they give it to you. Remember, United Nations, UNICEF, and the likes, the SDGs are not to reach a particular point and everybody talks. It's supposed to continue naturally. Some years ago, we did not have cars. Now we have cars and we're going to be having cars out unless something better comes up. So that is very, very important that the project has to be sustainable. If you're a couple, for example, or maybe say a temporary staff in a place, are you looking at transparent knowledge such that even if you're not there, then other people start you know, having access to that stuff? So your narrative should actually talk about the sustainability of your project. Then in terms of um, executive summary, this now talks about intentionally about your um, organization or yourself as an individual or whatever you've done and talks a lot about the achievements. These are kind of, kind of elaborate, you know, talks about compelling overview and then your impact to statistics. <clears throat> For example, you're an educator, you know, you've been in the educational sector for about five or six years, you know, you've taught five students, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. These are some of the stats that you actually need to um, have access to be able to put an executive summary so that people can now um, ensure that, I mean, the funders can see some of the things you've done so far. Very, very important. Then uh, the third part of that, so you've looked at the narrative section, you've looked at the executive summary. Another part that's very, very important is the project description. So this time around, so this time around, um, you're looking at the um, project description itself. So you know, you've talked about your, um, your the narrative of the project. You've talked about the um, um, the program that um, you know the program that you're doing. Um, yes, the, your your company itself. And the third part is now looking at the project itself. So this one now, we are going to elaborate a bit more on the project. What is the solution you are focusing on? It gets very, very important. Now, some of us can make the mistake of um, bloating or overemphasizing on the problem. You know, farmers do not have access to um, food to eat. This is, this, you know, you cannot make the problem so bad that the founder feels like he's helpless. His money or his solution cannot, I mean, his money or his grants cannot even solve that per se. And that might be why they might actually. So when you hammer too much on the problem, it's not as important as hammering especially on the solution. Now, it's almost difficult to see a particular problem in the world that you're the best person that's planning to solve it. So for each problem, you say, okay, this is the problem. It's so that to also be prudent enough to say that people are already working on it. This is how you want to contribute to that existing knowledge. It's very, very important. So the project should be a lot more aligned on focusing on how to solve that problem. And it depends on how you crafted it. If you paid attention some two or three minutes ago, you saw how the problem was access to education for children or for youth in the community. And how a tech person was able to do, look at, you know, creating a particular tool that makes it easier for remote learning. How some others was able to focus on road network, how some others was able to focus on street lights and all those other things. So those look, I mean, this thing can kind of look at the same problem, but how different people can actually package it. And then, for example, if a teacher, this might actually, if the tech person is an expert in the tech option, it actually helps that he has that knowledge and is putting that in. So it's very, very important. Then, also in your project description, if you've gotten previous funding in the past, it's also important that you kind of talk a lot about it. So because of time, I'll just rush to the remaining ones. For budgets and financials, yeah, it's important. I believe um, the world is a global village. So no matter who we are, it's important that we have access to people in our networks. For example, I want to advise us, unlike I mean, before I said, it's important to be on LinkedIn and then at the network. It's also important, especially at this age, have access to a friend, that is either going to be a tech person or someone that's very, very good with financials, so either an auditor, an accountant, or a financial expert. It might not even be an expert, but someone that has enough knowledge to, able to help you go through some of your budget and the less and help you present it <clears throat> better. Because one of the major things that this point what out for is to make sure that nobody wants to hear the excuse that you do not have knowledge or you don't know how to balance um, sheets so you know, calculate them, um, expected income, expenditure, you know, balance sheet, and all those other things. So, when it comes to your budget and financials. For example, if a funder says that they are going to be giving out $100,000 grant to 10 people, if you go and package your project to say that you are seeking $250,000 grants and they don't have that, they will disqualify your rate because they don't have that time to exchange it like a competition. So your research will tell you that this grant you're applying for has a cap on how much they're giving out people. So it's very important that your project kind of, if not matches that, but a bit lower than that. And I think for People that are very, very smart in doing this, if they have a hundred thousand dollar grant, you don't want to even exhaust that. You want to probably say that you're getting additional funding from probably your own personal post or from one or two other people. So that tells them that 
if they get that hundred, if they give you hundred thousand dollars, you project is one fifty thousand dollars. But if you have marked hundred thousand from them, they've gotten twenty thousand dollars from your personal self and about thirty thousand dollars from other people as well. So this kind of things makes your presentation smarter. So that means um, even without their fund, they already have a plan already, and just just going to be an addition. And also, um, if, uh, how much I'm supposed to get from um, the project, especially if you are probably in the um, aspect of making revenue per se, and then your expense breakdown. Very, very important. Your finance person or your auditor, your account person will tell you that for every expense you make, register it. So that's why some people advise that you have a corporate account. You have an account specific for funding. If you're unable to target the day-to-day expenses, an easier way to target might be to just download your bank statement. But it's very, very important that as um, when we're doing something like this, every expense should be tracked, whether it's down to the, um, you know, the um, airtime or the data or the transport allowance and all those. Because believe me, by the time you see an ideal example of a grant proposal and the likes, it has enough. I mean, by the time you send the format of what they did, then it has enough um, checks on it. And also, let me just recommend that your budget, the most, um, especially if it's for international grants, it's good you have it in two currencies, your local currency and then the USD, which is one of the major options for people to give out funds these days. Very, very important. If you do not want to submit, it is probably a foreign-based organization and they're talking about $100,000. You don't want to submit a grant in Naira or in, um, you know, in any other, uh, other currency. Converting can be very, very challenging. It's important that you have converted it and submit your budgets or whatever in the currency of the funders. If they say they need to euros, convert it to euros and the likes. Then also the, uh, the, the uh, almost final aspect of um, grant proposals talks about the timeline and milestones. Timeline and milestones. Okay, let me just um, rush through this. The project is supposed to start, let's say the funding is going to start by um, by November 2023, and you said it's going to run for six months. Um, yeah. I don't know how long, many slides you still have now, because okay. we have to yeah. fight to end this. Yeah. Six, seven minutes. I have about three or four slides, six, seven minutes. Is that fine? Okay, please. All right, that's fine. So okay, okay. okay. So let me just, let me just um, go to this. So for your timeline, it's very important in your um, proposal that you uh, mentioned. Is it the quarter? Is it the year? Is it the month and the legs? And each which timeline you have a particular activity. I'm going to hire some students. I'm going to buy a bus. I'm going to do this by this one. Next one, I'll do this. Next one, I'll do this. Next one, I'll do this. So the better way to prepare your budget is to break it into two timelines. This is the first one, you know. Um, going to the community, I pay for transport, I pay for feeding, I pay for accommodation, I pay for banners and stickers and other sort of You know, kind of break it down according to time and it kind of helps them a lot. Then uh, monitoring and evaluation is also very, very important as well. And um, let me just go to um, the uh, last slide. So this slide talks about, so let's assume you've submitted a good proposal, submitted a grant, and at the end of the day, you've either, um, you're about to get the grant or you've got the grant. How do you, how do you proceed with it? If you've been rejected by a grant or if you've been rejected by a proposal, it's not the end of the world. One important thing I tell people is that the fact that if you've been rejected means you've learned a lesson. That means you're better off at I mean, writing a proposal than someone that has not even applied before. So it's very important that you even keep a list and find out if possible why you were rejected and know how to work around it. Per se. Then if you're able to get funding from your funders, it's also important to schedule updates. The people that have been communicating with you by email, is it once a week, I mean, once a month or twice a month? Have a short call or you want to just send them a short document? Thanks for this. This is what you've done this so far, even if they did not ask for it. These are the way that I can actually ensure that I'm keeping a very, very good relationship with them. Then please, it's very, very important to maintain good communication and whatever you promise, ensure that you can deliver on it. The last part talks about impact. Please, for every project you are doing, Take as much pictures as you can, as much as possible. Take videos, do interviews and the likes. It's very, very important because at the end of the day, your funders, even if they don't mention it in the beginning, they're going to ask for your impact support to show that you actually did that work. So, you know, you want to take pictures and the likes. And at the end of the day, you want to publish something like this. One important thing, it's one of the best metrics you can use to get additional funding in the future is actually this last slide. You get the beautiful photo, the video, the pictures. Do a short um, story or a short video with slides, with, you know, voiceover and the likes. You can come out at the one when I talk about it and like, but when you package something like this, your next application, you can even attach it to your application that this is what I've done. And then for context, if you are using emails, then you probably want to attach the link to this, your impact spot under the email. Probably do you want to learn more, do you want to see what you've done in the past? Click here. So it actually gives you more options. So um, I think we've been able to cover quite a lot. Um, I, I don't know if I was talking too fast, but I believe we'll be able to share as much knowledge as we can within 
probably an hour or so about this. So I think I'll hand over to Emmanuel now with your questions for us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for this insightful and engaging session. We are so glad and we sincerely appreciate this knowledge which you ditched out this evening in line to grant writing. And um, I would like to, I can't, I can't, okay. I would like to see our appreciation in the comment session. Yes, let's show some love to our speaker. Let's show some love to our speaker, uh, facilitator for today. And he has done a lot of justice to today's topic. And he has actually prepared us ahead to um, get into be successful in this aspect of applying for grants and writing a very good proposal. And we have, um, we are going to quickly visit the aspect of the Q and A because it's very important to take questions before we end today's call, as we're going to be ending exactly 6 p.m. Uh, and I would like to identify one of people who would like to ask a question. Please raise your hand while I call on you. Then those of us that are on YouTube, please use the comment section to ask your question on YouTube. And before we go into the question proper, I would also like to inform that the tracking and evaluation form has been shared. Please, it's very important we fill this form before we leave because it's going to close at exactly 30 minutes after the workshop. Okay, I would like to start by calling on Samson. Samson, please, you can unmute your mic and ask your question in 30 seconds, please. Dr. Charles, please, we'll be taking like three questions at a time so that it will be easier and more faster for you to respond to them. All right, okay, Sam from Nigeria, you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, uh, I, I really gained a lot of insight on what you just said, but I, I want to ask- can you okay, speak on? All right. Okay. I want you to be. I I, I want you. To, I want you to help us to be more specific. Can you give us some specific programs where we can apply for grants uh, uh, at the moment, specifically? Okay. That's um, question one. Um, all right. Let me, let's take another question from. Please, if we do, it's important, let's take another question from Chio Mahigwe. Kindly unmute your mic and ask your question. Okay, hello, good evening. Okay, thank you, sir. That was a wonderful question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, yes, my question, you. what you mentioned concerning the LinkedIn profile. Okay, yeah. My question is actually on building the LinkedIn profile. Like me, I'm an educator, but I'm also involved in so many other things. And in my LinkedIn profile, I've kind of added some of the courses I've done that has to relate with technology, like IT support, and then that has to do with software engineering, education. Now, I've also been opportunity to work with an NGO that leverages on climate, but it's, that one has to do with clean air for Africa, talking about only the air. Now, if I'm to write a proposal based on all these different things and I'm adding all of them different, different, from different fields in my LinkedIn, how do I streamline them? Do I need to go and remove those things from my LinkedIn because it has always been a challenge and I'm kind of diverse. So how do I streamline to achieve a particular goal? That's okay, my how do you streamline them? Yeah. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Uh, we just take one more while we also check out for our YouTube participants. Okay, can we have Patrick? Patrick, one more you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Anita, please can you share the tracking and evaluation form for those who are on Zoom to ensure they feel that? Good evening, Doctor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Okay, thank you very much for the impactful uh, lecture that you have given us. My question is, um, if I have an organization that I'm working on maybe in school in helping some students, 
that are less privileged and I want to apply for grants, must I register for the organization maybe in Nigeria where you have CAC that you can register before any border that is, or any body or organization that is going to give us a grant accept the application? Okay, that all is right, thank you very much. All right, over to you, Dr. Charles. We appreciate your response to the questions. Okay, thanks. So thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate um, the questions. I think I will start with, um, I'm going to, for the second question about LinkedIn, I think I'll take the liberty to share my LinkedIn profile. I want to use mine as an example to kind of sell um, the explanation. But while I wait for it to show, um, but while I wait for it to show, I'm just going to, um, so let me be speaker. Okay, so while I wait for it to show, I'm just going to, um, sorry. So I'm going to just attempt the first okay, question. Okay, you're first question. Yeah, I'm going to attempt, attempt the first question that was asked. So for the specific programs, I'm forgetting the person I asked. So like I said, um, we have to be a bit careful about looking for just any program. But since we're all into the education, I want to talk about the, um, I want to talk about them. Um, the, um, yeah, for example, Orange Corners is a program sponsored by um, the Dutch Embassy, the Netherlands Embassy, as well as Space Foundation in um, in Lagos. And their major focus is actually on aspects of education. Okay, there's also um, Tule Lumalu Foundation that is vast. For example, my um, my after March, the company I work with started with the fund, went to agriculture. There are people that have started schools and education from the Tule Lumalu Foundation as well. So you know there are kind of lots of them around there. Then I think they are, I can't probably remember anyone specific to education, but there are quite a lot. But I think specifically for education, Orange Corners is one of it. Um, for example, a very, a very good way to go is go to um, LinkedIn, okay? Search education. I don't know if you can just take a note for those that ask or those interested. Go to LinkedIn, search education, then um, look at and filter to companies, okay? Each sort of organization, filter to companies, and then filter to Nigeria. What I going to see is, every educational entity that is based in Nigeria. You can even decide to filter SDG or filter impact or whatever, but education is going to be a very, very good keyword, okay? So go to um, the search on LinkedIn, you can see it on one page, the search bar or LinkedIn, search education here, yeah, you can see anything you want to search, search education, and you're going to see, um, you know, lots of, uh, you can even see educational organizations in Nigeria, in Kenya, in every other place, even outside the world, Asia and the likes. So you see, a, you see people, you see jobs, you see companies and the like. Click on company. Basically, organizations are merged into company as well. And I'm going to see all the organizations or companies in Nigeria that are aligned with education. They could be schools, they could be universities, they could be foundations, they could be the likes. And then filter to Nigeria. Then you can start checking it. For example, if you are based in um, Abuja, for example, you can filter into the FCT or filter to your state and see those that are there. So that's a very, very good tool. So any one of them that you now see a foundation, or something attached to the name. These are the ones that can actually be very, very aligned. But just orange corners, like the orange foods that we pick, orange corners, the corner of a building, for example, orange corners, search for it. It's very important. Yes. Then there's also Faith Foundation. I'm a volunteer for them. Although the bulk of their programs are focused on entrepreneurship, but they also have some aspects for education as well. But I think these are the key ones. Then for the next question about LinkedIn. So I don't know if she's um, paying attention. And if you look at my profile, your, a good question that my call will be, um, what is the direction this guy is going? He's into programs. I'm sure you listen to part of what you might read, programs, partnerships, business operations. I'm an artist as well. I actually studied veterinary medicine in my undergraduate and for my master's. And, you know, I do a lot of things. But at the end of the day, while somebody can say that I am not focused, another person can say that I am well experienced in a lot of things and I bring in all my experiences to be an advantage to me because I can actually talk all over a lot of things. For example, the presentations I'll be giving I give a lot of examples across a lot of places for, because the company I work now, we deal with farmers, we deal with technology, we deal with, um, remote, you know, we do a lot of things because of that vastness. So, in fact, it's even, I would prefer a LinkedIn profile that has enough kitties that sells you very, very well. All your competencies are here. So you leave it that way and then start to apply. When people check it. So by the time they are looking at your headlines and the likes, they will scroll down normally. If they see that you're a teacher or whatever, you could see, okay, scroll down. Of course, you studied education in school. That figures. You see that you are a tailor, or you could see that you are an entrepreneur, or whatever. You scroll down, you see that your experience, entrepreneur, or whatever, it's figures. So, there's, why should you not have 
entrepreneur, and this one. In fact, even if you're a preacher or you're a pastor or something, you can put it there. It's also a value addition to you. When they scroll down, they say that you're either heading a religious group or you're heading a church. If you're an advocate for this, you know those other things. So please, the, as long as you can actually defend and merge them together. For me, I've worked with farmers a lot. I work in a company that deals with farmers. I'm a veterinarian. That's because the goals as well. If you say I'm an artist, how does it help me? I pay attention to details. I can be very, very details. I'm a perfectionist to an extent. I can sit down for hours working on my laptop, working on a drawing. That's an advantage to anybody I'm going to partner with because any document that passes to me gets to a certain level of perfection. I'm an entrepreneur as well. I deal with profit or organizations and not for profit organizations. I've had the experience. I've done businesses and the likes. So it's easier for me to use my experience to teach people. I've handled business operations. And, you know, I've done a lot of other things. I've gone into equipment as well. So, that's helped you to package yourself, to present yourself better to people as a perfect person for them to give their money to because you are vastly focused on experience. So I think that covers. Then for the last um, question, um, okay, yeah, for registration. Yes, very important, but it also depends. Some funders or some grantees are not necessarily interested in giving you the kind of, especially when it comes to individuals, they might not need all those, um, all those back and forth, especially if, they are not foreign donors and they are probably based in your community. For example, if I'm a politician or let's say local government chairman or a leader in your community or in your local government or your state decides to give out, let me say, um, $1,000 to 200 people, it might be very, very difficult to start assuming that everybody that should align to the SDGs or should help us solve society, I mean, problems with society, have to go and register their accounts and the likes. It will be very, very difficult to expect that. So part of this tells you that, um, you know, it's very important that, depending on the kind of funding you're seeking out for, it won't be bad if you go to get a register. And that is why, to an extent, we have lots of all these organizations around there. But then, depending on the kind of funding you're looking at for, some might not really need it, some might need it. But if a company is going to give you funding based on maybe US dollars and the likes, naturally, not only must you be a, be a registered entity, you should have paid your tax, you should have a tax identity number, and you should have a corporate account. And it's almost difficult for you to have a corporate account without having all these other things. Because at the end of the day, apart from even having a corporate account, you must also have a foreign or a domiciliary account, especially. Especially if they're going to be paying the dollars directly to you. So I think these things are kind of very important. That's why I said it's important to research those that are going into. But for now, I mean, so if, if I were you, it's important to start talking to one or two people to start understanding the kind of things that is required for you to register. Like I said, registering is not just enough. Should be, there should be activity because you need to submit your audited accounts and other that. So it depends. As a single person or as a starting level, you might not need too much of that um, back and forth drama and the likes. At the end of the next level, you go to another thing. But I feel, depending on your should do your research, I want you to start. It's probably for now, start working with some of this. Uh, for example, the person I talked to about Orange Corners, what they do is that with or without any knowledge, they can start training you on all these other things. By the time they're done training, they can even help you register and help you do all those other stuff and position you better. Funders, so I think I think um, that uh, should answer the question. Uh, Iman, I'll over to you, please. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, and we sincerely appreciate the responses you, which you've given. Uh, these are so insightful. Please, I want to send this. It's very important we educators we take to instructions. Please, it said that tracking and evaluation for anonymous shared on the WhatsApp community. Whoever that does that, they are going to remove you from the program. Please take to these instructions. And you don't need to send unnecessary message, unnecessary group message or spammy message to the platform when the class is going on. It's frustrating and it's even bad when the program managers are locking the WhatsApp platforms. So please, let's keep to this. It's very, very important. And I, I want to say this as a closing note because we are really, really out of time. We might not be able to take so much questions. Um, Dr. Charles has done a lot of justice. This video, I mean, this um, workshop is available on YouTube forever. Let's endeavor to watch or to see it again and check and you can listen to the video over and over and over again. Then, and uh, most importantly, there was a learning resource link that was shared with us yesterday. You always find the presentation slide for all this workshop series there. So you don't have any issues, you always find it there. But please, I want to appeal to those of us spamming the page with different pictures, different messages. If there is anybody who found doing that, you are going to be removed. We are not going to ask or plea again. 
we just remove it from the program. It's very important we keep to this code of conduct and rules just for us to, uh, we would like a situation whereby we keep locking your platform. It's meant for you to connect, to network with each other, share positive, good information. I was happy when one of our, one of our um, educators here asked that, how can they have access to grants? Which platform can they have access to, to check for grants? There are a lot of platforms which you can have access to these grants. And definitely there are some, we always create grant opportunities every month for our communities, which you can check, you can apply based on your specific area of interest or SDG goal, which you are pioneering. And uh, once again, I want to plead to each and every one of us to please keep a very good uh, behavior and decorum while we are using it on the link, uh, I mean, on the community. And also over the weekend, the LinkedIn community link is going to be shared with us. We can get to connect with each other through that community, not you sharing your LinkedIn profile on the WhatsApp platform. A day can be dedicated to that for you to share that whereby you can connect with all others, but please let's avoid this. And I believe it's been a wonderful session this evening. Um, we sincerely want to appreciate our speaker for today. Thank you, Dr. Shas, for this wonderful and insightful session which you led with us. We are so grateful. On behalf of the leadership of ADEF Africa, we want to say thank you so much. And I can see he has already shared his LinkedIn profile on the comment session. Please, Anita, Esther, kindly pick it up so that we can share with the community of educators to get to engage with him. And you can also see a lot of opportunities which he might likely post and we always like to post and share with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Charles, for this wonderful session. And uh, sincere regards to Dr. Uh, Oyedotu. We are so much appreciate all you do at AfriMatch. And we wish you a wonderful and productive weekend. Have a wonderful weekend, sir. And our dear educators, we believe it's been a wonderful series all through this week two of the Teach for SDGs program. And right about now, we are going to be closing today's session. And our next workshop series is going to be next week's Friday. Same time, same link, same platform. Please do well and join very early. And like I said, the LinkedIn. Um, community is going to be shared with us and also the learning resources are going to be shared with us which you can always download on google drive and you have access to that drive forever it's, it's your platform so and definitely there are some self-paced courses that were shared with us via email yesterday let's endeavor to also enroll on these courses it's also aid and help and um, add more knowledge it gives us vast knowledge and experience in line to sustainability and sustainable development at large we wish you a wonderful weekend and please we want to keep the group open please don't spam it with unnecessary messages we beg you we are appealing to you now we want a situation whereby we kept removing uh, educators from the platform. It's your platform. You have to network. You have to connect with each other. You have to learn from each other. We are proud that we have over um, over 20 countries that are participating in this program as we speak. However, it's very important you get to share experience, learn from each other. You can even select a topic you want to discuss on per night. And these are things which we expect you do at uh, this moment. I wish you a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Our regards to Dr. Ayo. And have a wonderful weekend.